the mockingbird is mocking us. He's so much more advanced. He gets so much more what's going on in the natural world, the relationships between these bird timbres and rhythms. He's way beyond us. He's just making fun of us. People scratching our heads trying to figure out what it all means. The mockingbird might be the one who knows. The Mockingbird is one of nature's first sampling artists or DJs or like an electronic musician. He cuts and pastes things together. He's doing exactly the same thing that electronic musicians are doing by cutting and pasting things from here and there, changing their speed, changing their pitch, changing their sound quality. He hears an oven bird, goes, teacher, 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 teacher. And then he says, oh, well, I'm going to change that first phrase to a blue jay call and go, nature, nature, nature. Like, oh, that's kind of cool. And then I can put in something like a yellow throat, witchity, 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 witchity. And then that's some contrast, put in a red-tailed hawk. Bing! It's like a whole phrase. It's all figured out. They do these things. And so I describe that to some scientists that go, what do you mean they do that? They go, yeah, just listen. That's what they're doing. He goes, oh, yeah, prove it. David Rothenberg is a composer, jazz musician, and the author of Why Birds Sing, A Journey into the Mystery of Birdsong. He's a professor of philosophy and music at the New Jersey Institute of Technology, and that tells me that he's very likely the kind of person who would eagerly take up the challenge of describing, if possible, even proving what it is he hears in birdsong. I'm Marcus Smith, and this is Constant Wonder. At various times, Rothenberg has been found exploring the very outer limits of what's possible in the way of musical performance by playing his clarinet with animals, music-making animals like cicadas and whales. But we're going to save those stories for a later episode. Today, we're going to sing a duet with him in praise of mockingbirds. Rothenberg has had an awkward relationship with mainstream bird scientists. I think you could call them orthodox ornithologists. Ever since he published his 2006 book, Why Birds Sing, that is where he issued them a challenge that, frankly, put many of their beaks on edge. Stop studying bird songs by tearing out the brains and syrinxes of birds, Rothenberg said, and start studying this from the perspective of the bird as a musician. I should let you know, by the way, a syrinx is what a bird has instead of a larynx. Now, his challenge to them actually ended up cutting both ways. He was trying to call them out for their usual methodologies, but they threw it right back at him, which made him start to think. Well, let's get some scientists together, come up with a study that might make them happy because a musician has a very different criteria for truth. An artist has a very different criteria for truth and success than a scientist does. I can play one duet with a white-crested laughing thrush and say, oh, that's pretty cool. I like it. I think we got something there. And I can encourage people to listen to it and say, here's some music I made with this bird. But to prove that anything testable or duplicatable or, or repeatable happened there that really is of, of statistical significance, I got to do it like a thousand times and measure what's going on. Now, most artists and musicians say that's pretty boring, but those who want to study the musical phenomenon, well, they study things like that. So I figured if I collaborated with two different kinds of scientists that I could really make some progress here and really show scientists that, you know, it's not just that the mockingbird is uh, using songs from hundreds of other birds, but the way he puts it together is very specific. An illustration of Darwin's idea that birds have a natural aesthetic sense. It's a perfect example of what he was talking about. Do birds have a natural aesthetic sense? And if so, is that sense actually something you can observe in something like a mockingbird's song? If Darwin was thinking about this issue back in his day, when did the whole question go missing from the scientific discourse? You know, another way to ask the question is this. Where are today's Darwins who might risk making birds into artists? Somebody somewhere ought to be pursuing this still. If underpinning Darwinism is the whole bit about survival, you know what I'm talking about. Go find food, don't die while you're at it, and be sure to reproduce. Is there any reason that natural selection should ever have resulted in any animal's leisurely engagement, pleasurable diversion, you know, something like the musical arts? 
Well, hold on to these questions. We're going to circle back to them. First, I want to consider what Rothenberg and his collaborators have been able to find in the musical structures, the musical habits that characterize the songs of mockingbirds. They use so many techniques used by human musicians. When we decided to measure this, we tried to be very specific because we knew how hard it was to do statistics on thousands of songs and phrases. So we just focused on the transitions, how the mockingbird moves from one kind of sound to the next. And my hypothesis was that he doesn't change everything. He morphs gradually from one sound to, to the next. And let's try and describe this in the simplest possible terms. Originally, I had like 15 different ways he did this just by listening to them, then 12 different ways, then eight. We put it down to four. And we figured out the four simplest ones we could demonstrate were happening most of the time because you could statistically analyze that. That's how we figured that out. But it took three people with very different ways of understanding a natural phenomenon. So these four techniques are very common in human music, even in Beethoven. Da -da -da -dum, da -da -da -dum. Same pattern different pitch, you know, it's basic. Beethoven is doing the same things mockingbirds were doing. Now he, he was in Europe, he'd never heard a mockingbird. If he had, he might've said, ah, he might've changed his pastoral symphony and it'd been way more complex if he had mockingbirds to reckon with. And today we recognize all kinds of noises and rhythms and beats as being musical. We can recognize all kinds of direct noises from natural sources, artificial salt sources can instantly be turned into music. And what mockingbirds do is they, they cut and paste sounds from the natural world. But the way they work with them, most tellingly, the way they work with sounds is following these rules that we try to articulate and prove in a statistical way we're actually there to make scientists happy. It'll be helpful here to bear in mind an important distinction, the difference between a bird call and bird song. Some birds seem to emit only the kinds of sounds that perform specific functions conducive to survival. Others sing on and on and on with seemingly infinite complexity and with no apparent reason. So call and song, what's the big difference? Bird calls are sounds the birds make that have very specific meanings, like hey, I'm hungry, or watch out, there's a hawk flying overhead. And these sounds with specific meanings, interestingly enough, are often innate. The birds just know them. They're born with the ability to understand these calls and make these calls. But the songs in many species need to be learned. The little baby birds have to hear adult. In most species, just for a few months, they have the learning ability. In other species, like nightingales, mockingbirds, parrots, they have their whole life, they can learn new sounds. But learn the sounds they must. They actually have an ability to hear, listen to what they hear, and then learn to do. And these sounds are more complicated. They're more musical. They're more structured and shaped. And the function of them is usually thought to be to defend a territory or to attract a mate. That being said, what's in the songs is kind of separate from their function. Like a chickadee has a call, chickadee, chickadee, dee, 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 chickadee, the bird's name is named after the call. The song is just two notes, do, 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 do. Then you have somebody like the mockingbird singing hundreds of phrases, copying other birds, learning from all kinds of different species. And its song has the same function to defend a territory or attract a mate. Why does the mockingbird need something so complicated to do the same thing? Seems like a real waste of energy, doesn't it? Except the whole aesthetic of that species, the whole ethos of what it means to be a mockingbird involves having an incredibly complicated, ornate, unusual, weird song. That's just what that bird is about. What a bird is about. This makes me think of the mysteriousness or wonder that is inherent in any living creature. Would this wondrousness evaporate completely if we finally figured out precisely what a certain creature is about? Its essential being, its core, its very nature. With what David Rothenberg just said, I think we're actually talking about a mockingbird's potential desire to experience beauty or take delight in the world, or its impulse to stay in the world for reasons beyond merely staying. Emily Dickinson famously wrote, Hope is the thing with feathers. And I think it's fair for us to ask with the philosopher Rothenberg, is a bird more than just 
A hope for survival wrapped up in feathers. You know, questions like this don't seem to come up very much in the biological sciences, at least not in my experience. It's just not easy to get a scientist to conjecture for very long about, oh, a bird's personal mission statement, its sense of identity, its, its purposes, its hopes, its dreams, its aspirations for quality of life. David Rothenberg seems to me to be just about audacious enough in this very nebulous realm to consider these things in a way that bridges to science. I want to introduce you now to scientist Dave Gammon, one of David Rothenberg's collaborators. They've been working rigorously to produce analyses of Mockingbird's sonic production, or if you dare call it music, go ahead, I don't care. Uh, Dave Gammon began his career in biology, studying the humble chickadee. Rothenberg mentioned this species just a few moments ago. Now, the chickadee is a straightforward vocalist that pretty much sticks to a very basic set of calls and songs. To introduce Dave Gammon, here's the lowly chickadee pumping out a few notes. How hard is it to switch lanes from the chickadee lane to the mockingbird <laughs> lane? <laughs> um, it it was challenging, I suppose. It was a lot of fun. I mean, it, one to to some extent, one prepared me for the other. It's it's all birds. It's all sounds. Similar uh, tools of analysis. So it was it was a switch, but I wouldn't say it was the hardest thing I've ever done. And a chickadee, I presume, has an impoverished repertoire compared to the mockingbird. Oh, yes. Right. Across most of the country, the chickadee has a lonely repertoire of just one song type, and that's it. And where I did my research, which was in Fort Collins, Colorado, we saw the evolution of a repertoire. There were three song types, not one, but three. So that was quite dramatic, we think. But uh, mockingbirds have several hundred song types, and nobody's ever really quantified it very well. If you try to quantify the number of song types that they do, it seems to me like a black hole. I've never tried to do that, and I never think that I will. Imagine if you were going to listen to somebody speak English, and you had no idea how to interpret English, and you had no idea how many words there were. And so you just start copying every single word that you hear, and you think you've got most of them because you're not hearing that much new. And then somebody pulls out a word like spaghetti. And you're like, spaghetti? I've never heard spaghetti before. And then several minutes later, you hear, uh, you know, let's say the word Bolshevik or something like that. And you think, I've never heard that. And then you go for a month and you are cataloging more and more English, but you never hear the word Bolshevik. Uh, for mockingbirds, they have a lot of words that are like Bolshevik that they possess, they will use. If you listen to them for hours and hours, you will occasionally hear these really rare song types, but you just never get to the bottom of the barrel. Um, the, the person who did the most work to, to quantify that is Kim Derrickson. Um, he did this amazing study where he quantified the, the number of song types as well as anybody ever has for mockingbirds. And he figured out that about 25% of their song types are sung only once in this sample he has, exhaustive sample of thousands and thousands of songs. So maybe the very project of assembling a, a grand catalog, a, an encyclopedic uh, collection of these songs, mm -hmm. is just not the analysis that is going to be attractive in the end. Well, it's not the analysis that I've attempted. <laughs> but it's, uh, yeah, I mean, if somebody does it, I'll be very interested to see what, what they come up with. I expect it's going to be hundreds and hundreds, maybe even thousands of song types. But uh, I don't anticipate that anybody will do that study anytime soon. You know, there are things to do with language if you're studying it, besides just uh, looking at dictionaries and lexicons. Y you could look at poetry. You could look at stories. that are, There's lots of things you could look at. And I'm, so what are you looking at in, in Mockingbird Song? Right. So the, the fact that, it, that bird song is called song is kind of anthropomorphic, and it uh, gives an interesting suggestion of how you might look at bird song. So that was what led uh, um, David Rothenberg and Tina Roeski and I to examine Mockingbird's song as 
a musician, a musicologist would examine human music. So um, that was a lot of fun with that. And we found that um, mockingbirds use these compositional techniques that's sort of what a, like what a composer would call variations on a theme. So we were able to, to show that that exists in a uh, songbird. So the song of a single mockingbird uh, isn't going to be consistently the same. They're going to tweak it and it's going to morph and it'll go through different variations. Absolutely. If you listen to a mockingbird, you'll hear them uh, tweak. Uh, they'll, they'll go from one song type to the next. But there's often this really cool acoustic relationship between successive song types. So it will be similar to the previous song type, but different in one characteristic way, such as the pitch went a little bit higher, tweet, 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 something like that. Or they might bring the pitch lower or they might change the timbre a little bit, the sound quality of it. They might uh, stretch out the notes a little bit. And these subtle but musical uh, compositional techniques are used by mockingbirds anytime they sing. A call, in my mind, has a, a, some, a, a function, perhaps, that can be deduced by us humans, but maybe a song not so much? Um, no, so songs have functions. They're just... Uh, um, they're more complicated. So the way to think of it is uh, calls are short, songs are long. Calls have a clear function. Songs are, um, well, they all have clear functions. Songs are about breeding and uh, in mockingbirds, they're about breeding, uh, trying to impress a female mockingbird or to stimulate her in some way. In many other songbird species, songs can also be about males fighting with other males but calls have a variety of functions, whereas songs have just a limited function. Um, there are some exceptions, but that, that dichotomy of songs and calls works fairly well for a lot of songbird species. How confident are you that all songs, you know, these universal statements are always risky, but all songs, <laughs> yes, they are. All songs have functions. Um, I, I'm not 100% confident of, the, of that at all, Mark. <laughs> so I think that it's, it's safe to assume that most of them do. Um, but occasionally maybe they just ramble a little bit. I mean, sometimes I'm walking around the house cleaning and I start something spills out of my mouth and there was no function at all to it. So why couldn't a bird do that? You know how a cat plays with a mouse sometimes? It's not necessarily all about eating the thing. That's, you know, there could be a diversion going on. There could be entertainment perhaps in a song. I don't know. Yeah, and that's, that's a neat idea because uh, Darwin, if actually the, the, the study of bird song was referred to by uh, Charles Darwin, and he thought that bird song from a bird's perspective was probably a very aesthetic thing which just subjectively that they like listening to it, sort of the way that people will listen to music while they're cleaning or doing their homework or something. Uh, the, that that, obser that uh, hypothesis of Darwin has never really been followed up on very well in the birdsong community. I think part of it is that uh, a lot of the STEM people are just not that interested in arts and humanities. So what about you, though? Are, are you inclined to think, I'm going to make a little room for this idea of an aesthetic kind of bird song? Right. I'm sort of the anomaly in there. It's fun going to the scientific meetings and talking about the, the, the bird song from a musical perspective. For me, it seems fairly natural. Um, I was a music minor when I was an undergraduate at BYU. Uh, I still remember being in the Wind Symphony with, uh, you know, uh, David Blackington and being on the, the the marching band field and all that. And it was a lot of fun. So, uh, But I think a lot of the, the scientists that go to meetings with me, they don't do much with music. They don't sing. They don't hear a lot of the things in music that I would hear. Um, so they're just not as familiar with it. And I, I think it's not so much that they're anti-art or anti-music. It's just... It's just not, a, they don't see the relevance of it as well. So when you meet somebody like David Rothenberg, then, who is a musician, uh, and he is also interested in bridging over with his music to uh, the animal kingdom and what animals are generating in the way of song, so-called, uh, what do you make of somebody like David? Are you immediately inclined to say, oh, a scientist can hang with him? Short answer, yes. Uh, but I recognize that he is an anomaly in his world, 
for him to say, oh yeah, music can be found in non-humans. Sure, in animals, no problem. I can even communicate with them. I'll, and so he'll you know, connect his clarinet up to some hydrophone and, uh, in, and then try to do a, perform a duet with a whale. That is funky. And that is not normally done in the musical world. And so he, by venturing into the biological world, is sort of an anomaly in his world. And I, by venturing into the musical world, and kind of an anomaly in my world. So that's why he and I get along so well. Well, are you finding some kind of foundation where there's a synthesis going on between your two different disciplines? Sure, but I think that the, that synthesis is coming along pretty slowly. Uh, there's really not a lot of people who look at animal sounds as if they were a musical thing. And so, um, yeah, it, it's, it's wide open to try to, to, to discover that because I don't feel like that we as a scholarly community have a good, uh, we, we haven't really wrapped our heads around it yet. Dave Gammon, David Rothenberg, and a third collaborator, Tina Roaski, may be sailing in mostly uncharted waters here. And so they've decided to make a few charts of their own. For one thing, they've already mapped out some very specific techniques that are used by mockingbirds in their sonic production. I I say sonic production because, frankly, now I'm a wee bit nervous about calling it music. Even just calling it bird song seems a little bit risky. Stick around if you want to explore this handful of techniques a little later on with Dave Gammon. He's going to give us an audio-guided tour through the aspects of pitch, timbre, and tempo. All of these three things manipulated by mockingbirds in their very adroit mimicry. Right now, though, we're going to put our ears to some of the more basic aspects of how a mockingbird mocks. We're also going to test our ability to distinguish between a virtuoso mockingbird and a rank beginner. Well, I do have here with me some clips. You knew that I'd be coming with some bird calls or sounds. Uh, aside from the amphibian that we're going to hear from, these are, these are mockingbird sounds. Here's uh, two sounds, and I'll play them back to back, and you can explain for us. Okay, here goes. The first sound was the ribbit call of the Pacific tree frog. The second one was a mockingbird mimicking the Pacific tree frog. Have you nailed that down? You know that that was actually the mockingbird borrowing the sound from that amphibian? There was no question in my mind that that second one was a mockingbird imitating a frog. Um, This is a study that I did with Anna Corsiglia, who was an undergraduate at Elon University with me, and she memorized dozens and dozens of frog calls from all across North America and then listened to dozens and dozens of hours of song from mockingbirds. That was definitely a mockingbird imitation of a frog. Why would a mockingbird want to imitate a frog? (laughs) Nobody knows that, but we know that they do. Um, I can think of several hypotheses. Uh, Mockingbirds are generally not speaking with frogs, as far as I know. They, They copy the sounds of frogs, but the frogs don't listen to them, and they don't listen to the frogs. What who is listening is the female. So it could be that the female is particularly impressed by a wide variety of sound. And what could be more variable than to mimic several species besides yourself and even some non-bird species such as amphibians? So that would be my best hypothesis, but we've never done a study to prove that that's what the, the function is. Am I to understand that this mockingbird, the male, is behaving like a strutting peacock, and instead of lots of feathers, the male comes equipped with lots of sounds? I think that's a great analogy, Marcus. Sure. A mockingbird is a peacock with uh, songs, mimetic songs, instead of feathers coming out. Great. Let's go on to the next sounds here. Same trick? Yes, yes, but that's not a mockingbird in California like the last one. This is a mockingbird from my home turf here in North Carolina, and we have a different set of frog species. The first one you heard is called the Cope's Gray Tree Frog, 
And the second one was a mockingbird imitation of it. Okay. <laughs> Help me out. Tell me a little bit more about why, other than just being able to observe this and record it and maybe write an, uh, some kind of an article about it where it's been observed and, and documented, does it go beyond that for you? Um, maybe. So the, the story of how this study came to be is a, a really fun one. Um, I was in Canada at a scientific conference and I was listening to a friend of mine present on something completely unrelated when suddenly it hit me that a study that I just published on mockingbirds imitating other bird species could be applied to more than just birds. The The finding that I had um, is about a topic called model selection. So it's if you're a mimic, then you hear all these things. You hear squeaky wheels and you hear trains going by and you hear cars and you hear whistles and you hear lots of birds. How do you know what you're going to mimic? You've got this incredible um, capacity to imitate. So what are you going to mimic? And what uh, what I found in this earlier study, Gammon 2013, is that uh, they mimic the sounds in their environment that already sound similar to the sound to the non-mimetic sounds that they make, and that worked pretty well for the birds. But in the process of doing that study, I'd noticed that mockingbirds around here imitate a Cope's gray tree frog, and I started thinking, do they mimic other frogs? And I thought, well, they only rarely mimic Cope's gray tree frogs. But mockingbirds imitating frogs, that's kind of cool. So I talked to some friends about it, and they said, yeah, you know, we can help get you some uh, recordings. So uh, my student, Anna Corsigli, and I uh, formed this really amazing network of friends all across North America, and we were able to collect mockingbird sounds, not just from North Carolina and Texas, where I had lived, but from locations all across the country. And we were really excited to test the hypothesis from my earlier study, and it ended up fitting really well with the frogs. So they um, were more disproportionately likely to mimic the frogs that already had the right kind of pitches, the right kind of tempo. And in some cases, they even modified the frog sounds. When the toad itself sings, it'll go... And then it'll go on for another 20 seconds, something like that. Well, there's no way that a mockingbird could sing for that long. So they go... So they do just the first part, which is all they can do with their, their breath supply. So I'm going to do a little recap here, just and, and you tell me if I'm getting this right. If there are sounds made by other animals, I don't know how wide that net goes, if it includes squirrels and armadillos, I don't know. <laughs> I don't either. I don't think I don't do. even know if an armadillo makes a sound for that matter. But, but <laughs> if... if uh, animals around them that are they're in the proximity of other creatures and if those other creatures are making sounds they might be tempted to imitate those sounds if and maybe only if it's within the scope of their vocal apparatus so this is a finding that applies to mockingbirds i don't know if it applies to other species i think probably not because the ability to imitate another species is pretty rare uh, most songbirds like chickadees or the towhee that you mentioned earlier, they are not going to imitate another species. But mockingbirds can do it. Starlings can do it. Blue jays can do it. Crows might be able to do it. So there's just a handful of, of species that do it. Um, I have some friends in my scientific circle who have looked at model selection in other mimicking species, species such as the lyre bird of uh, Australia. And my hypothesis of imitating the sounds that already sound similar doesn't seem to apply in the lyre bird. So it might be just a, a mockingbird rule. So if it's a rule, then uh, a mockingbird is absolutely disinclined to imitate if it could even hear it, the song of a whale or an elephant. Exactly, or, yes. Or, or a lion. It has to be within their zone. Right. It has to be, can't be too high, can't be too low pitched, can't be too fast. So like a, a, a junco, they do this really fast trill thing. Mockingbirds are never going to imitate it. It's just too fast for them. And then there's some things that are just too rambly for them, like a, a robin. If you wake up, and I'm sure you'll hear this in Provo, I wake up at 5 a.m. and the very first bird calling is probably a robin as it sings its song. Well, its song is just jumbled up. 
You know, it's like every every sound is different from the previous one. But in mockingbirds, they have to repeat it. So it's like something like that. And because robins don't make a repetitive sound, they're ignored by the mockingbirds. But robins do make a call that sounds more like something like that. Well, that's repeated, so mockingbirds will imitate that. Yeah, I'm just looking for the candy that the mockingbird is going after, you know? I'm looking for what really is appealing there. Of course. But it has to do, it has to do with their... Um, I, I don't know, aptitude or, or their apparatus. That what they can do, they'll try to do. Yeah. So, it, in in a very broad sense, it, this is just rules for how learning takes place. So, when we humans are learning our song, our language, then we disproportionately pay attention to certain kind of sounds. For example, if they come from parents, other humans, and then we disproportionately ignore sounds that don't fit those cues that we're looking for. So mockingbirds are learning their songs just like humans are learning our speech. And mockingbirds have rules that governs what they pay attention to and what they're willing to learn from. So now that you've talked about learning, and that has to do with whether they're humans or mockingbirds, we're talking about juveniles versus adults. We do have some samples of uh, different types of mockingbird songs drawn from different uh, parts of uh, life stages, I guess. I'll, I'll play three different samples of mockingbird songs, and I'm going to call them A, B, and C. Let's listen to them each individually, and you can guide us through what's going on here. Here's A. Sounds like that bird's jumping around from different, you know, kinds of little tricks. Absolutely. So, Marcus, that A is is sung by an older male, an older male mockingbird. Um, if you listen to it carefully, you can see it's highly stereotyped that it repeats a sound many times in a row. And when that happens, that signals to anybody listening, such as a, a female that might want to be impressed by a male, that uh, he knows how to repeat sounds well. He has a well-refined song. That kind of sound also contains more mimicry than less refined song. If you listen carefully between A and B, B is going to come across as a little bit less stereotyped. Well, let's hear it. That sounded to me like a tentative bird. Right, yeah, and that tentativeness is a lack of stereotype. If it's tiddle, 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 weep, 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 you know, you're, it's just repeating exactly the same way over and over again. That's highly stereotyped. So that second example is maybe it's not as old of a bird or maybe it's a bird with a less refined uh, song. Uh, I, I assume that a female would be less impressed by sample B. <laughs> well, I certainly was less impressed. <laughs> with, with your help, you're guiding me through this, of course. Dave, here's, here's my last sample, and maybe this is Goldilocks in between young and old. I don't know. What do we got there? So you could hopefully you could hear that there's really not a lot of stereotypy to that. There, there is some attempt to repeat syllables, but it's kind of buzzy. It's just not very stereotyped. There was not a bit of mimicry in that very in that last one. So it's an undisciplined bird. It's a lazy bird. Um, I think better than lazy is a young bird. So the mockingbirds they hatch for the first time in the spring, and then the babies don't make any singing at all for several months. So what you heard is probably uh, you know the the first few songs of an individual. So meaning like it probably just started trying to sing maybe a couple or three weeks earlier than that. So it's just really unstereotyped song, no mimicry in there. Um, it'll get better, and probably within a month or two, he'll be singing better than that. But uh, but that shows uh, the the some of the developmental progress that males have to make in their singing before they'll ever impress a female, get a mate, have kids. Well, I want to go back now to this 
interesting uh, foray that you have made, an excursion kind of away from your scientific discipline into the into the uh, artistic realm. And you've done this with David Rothenberg and Tina Roeski, and uh, you each come with different things to add to the, uh, to this recipe. Uh, what have you been aiming for as a team? Right. Uh, we would like to get a very interdisciplinary understanding of birdsong as a musical phenomenon. So my role was to be the naturalist, the one who goes around chasing birds in their natural habitat and understands what's going on in the ground, on the trenches. Tina Roeski was uh, amazing at... Um, at uh, doing this signal analysis. So she would make these fine-grained acoustic measurements that uh, then she uh, assessed with complex statistical analysis. And she is also trained in neuroscience, so she could look at things in a very technical labby sort of way. Uh, and then David Rothenberg is trained in more of the arts and humanities tradition. And so he could examine the notes from a musical perspective and bring up insights that wouldn't come na as naturally to me as a scientist. It seems to me that there's an issue here of freedom in a bird. Uh, the whole question of instinct or uh, maybe is it just utter randomness of imitation? Or is there any kind of self-awareness? How, how would we ever know that about a bird? Whether a bird is self-aware to the point that the bird could say, well, right now I've got to call a mate. Or, well, right now I'm just practicing my songs. Or right now I'm just having fun. I don't even know how anybody could tease that out with any kind of a basis for making any claims about it. <laughs> what we need is to train the birds how to speak in English so they can tell us for themselves. <laughs> oh my goodness, yes. I mean, you, you've hit on the million-dollar question, how to understand the intents and perceptions, the subjective perceptions of a bird, because we're thinking about that all the time. The, the paper that Tina and David and I did, we're very transparent that we're focused on human perceptions of the bird song. It would be so much better and so much more convincing if we could look at bird subjective impressions of the bird song. But we just don't have the tools for that yet. So when you get ideas for it, let me know and we'll, we'll become famous. Dave Gammon has become my favorite mocking human. He makes those bird call sounds with, with such panache, you know. He has a vast repertoire uh, when it comes to imitating bird calls and songs. Well, in a forthcoming episode, we're going to circle back again to visit with David Rothenberg some more, whom I also greatly admire. Uh, we'll talk with him about making music together with whales, cicadas, and other non-human makers of sound. And in just a moment, we're going to dive into today's promised bonus feature. That's an audio-guided tour with Dave Gammon, sorting out with some greater precision what it is a mockingbird does in altering pitch, timbre, and tempo to generate their songs. David Rothenberg is a professor of philosophy and music at the New Jersey Institute of Technology. David Gammon, a professor of biology at Elon University. Our thanks to both of them for sharing their time and expertise. This episode of Constant Wonder, produced by Eric Soltzko with Paige Crumperman Darrington. Thanks also to Parker Schmidt and the BYU Broadcasting Sound Design Team. I'm Marcus Smith for Constant Wonder. <laughs> We're going to talk now about the four techniques of musical variation used by mockingbirds, as outlined by Rothenberg and Gammon and their co-author Tina Roeski. Roeski, I want to let you know, is of the Max Planck Institute for Empirical Aesthetics. You're going to be hearing audio clips representative of the kinds of manipulations used by mockingbirds. Not just by mockingbirds, actually, as you'll see in just a moment. These little tricks are related to pitch, timbre, and tempo. We're going to start with a curveball for you to demonstrate the quality of sound called timbre. What you're hearing is not a mockingbird. 
Dave Gammon says, though, that it's a great illustration of changing timbre. Timbre isn't an everyday word. Timbre is the quality of a vibration independent of things like volume or pitch or speed or any rhythmic aspect, any other such factor. Timbre is just the quality of the sound labeled with a fancy French word. Think of the same note played by maybe a string instrument, but then a brass instrument, maybe an electric guitar, a double reed, an oboe, bassoon. You get the idea. That's timbre differentiation. See if you can hear the differences in timbre now as demonstrated by this group of Tuvan throat singers. And then we'll have Dave Gammon elaborate. So if you listen to the samples, there's similar pitches, but what changes is the quality of the sound. In one case, it's more spread open. That's the second one. And in the first one, it's it's a little bit tighter. Uh, musicians call that changing the timbre. I could replicate that by if I do something like dee, 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 or dee, 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 something like that. It was the same notes, but you can hear the quality of the sound was different. The timbre changed. Do you mind if I try that myself? I would love to hear you do it. I'll go... Ah, oh, no, that's changing the pitch. Ah, yes, 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 that's, that's changes in timbre. When we change vowels or change consonants, uh, that naturally changes the timbre. Well, let's compare it now to a mockingbird with some kind of timbre variation going on here. So the first two notes came from a mockingbird imitating the alarm call of an American robin. The second two notes, the third and the fourth notes, came from a mockingbird imitating the rubber ducky vocalization of a brown-headed nuthatch. Now, if you just listen casually to it, the four notes kind of sounded about the same. But if you listen a little bit more carefully, the third and the fourth note are a different timbre than the first and the second note, even though the pitch hasn't changed much. So that's what an example of what we call timbre change. So just for good measure, here it is again. Yeah, I think I'm hearing it. With timbre out of the way now, that's the toughest one. Let's turn to the issue of pitch. Here's a mockingbird again playing two otherwise identical sounds, but shifting the pitch. So the first note that you heard was from a mockingbird imitating what's called the long call of a northern flicker, which is a type of woodpecker that's found throughout Utah and much of the United States. The second note came from, it was a non-mimetic call, meaning uh, it's a mockingbird-specific note. And the second one was quite a bit higher pitched than the first pitch. So it's similar timbre, similar tempo, but just changing the pitch. So is the mockingbird capable then of doing a a pure mimetic imitation without having any temptation to dink around with it and tweak it? (laughs) I don't think you could stop them from (laughs) dinking around with it. That's what they do. Now, I've introduced this last sort of manipulation of sound with the word tempo, which most of us generally think of as the spectrum of possible speeds, you know, going from slow to fast or very slow to very fast or very, very slow to very, very fast. Our guests today refer to the tempo changes that they detect in mockingbird songs as squeezing and stretching. And I think those two terms work very well for present purposes. Although the musician in me says that when you speed things up or slow them down most radically, that's what feels, to, at least to me, the most like squeezing or stretching, not the more subtle kinds of tempo changes. When the mockingbird does this bluebird, you're going to hear two versions of the bluebird song. The first one's shorter, and the second one is sounds similar, 
but it's more stretched out. So it's not changing the timbre, it's not really changing the pitch, but it's stretching out the notes. There you go. G G G G G G G G G G G G G G something like that. They'll sing similar songs, but then they'll do like a double time version of the same thing. And on the flip side, you can have a mockingbird feeling so antsy, so impatient, it just wants to speed things up. You know, get the job done. So ignore the little deep part, and then it's just tweet, 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 and then beetle, little, beetle, little. Do you actually have to like uh, record this stuff and analyze it closely to 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 follow the? Oh my goodness! Yes, I'll have to listen to it a couple times, three times, sometimes twenty times before I feel like I've mastered what the bird is really doing. Um, it's it's hard to keep up with those little squeakers. We humans love our music, and even without knowing any musical terminology, we just sing along to our favorite recordings or playlists. We do this all the time. The best of us sing in the shower, hitting high notes, low notes. We imitate this or that famous singer's style and their timbre. Whatever the song requires. But the clincher, when we compare ourselves with, oh, let's say, mockingbirds, it's that we do it for beauty, for pleasure, for fun, uh, for a connection to our culture, maybe to impress somebody. Well, that last one, that's a, that's a doozy. Principles of evolution tell us that impressing someone, that's a mockingbird's primary agenda with birdsong. But dare we say, how do we know that they're not having any fun in their own raucous sort of birdie belt singing. They do belt sing, you know. Dave Gammon has a sort of grand finale ready for us to hear. Mockingbird fireworks. Now, Dave, I'm not even going to ask you to try to walk us through this next one, but I'll just trust that this uh, last example is where all the techniques get tucked in. It, it just shows an example of how much the mockingbird changes from song to song to song. So, in our paper, we talk about these four types of morphing where we isolate one song and then the one immediately following it. But what you could hear from that clip is that Mockingbird's song is a whole lot more than just two songs with one right after the other. The reality is they'll have dozens, sometimes hundreds, maybe even thousands of songs strung together morphing throughout there. So sometimes they'll have a string of syllables in a row with continuous morphing. So it gets faster, 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 kind of like the Kendrick Lamar or maybe the pitch. More commonly, I'll hear the, the pitch start out high and then the second one will be a little bit lower. The third one will be a lower yet. The fourth one will be lower. Or I'll see hear a continuous change in the timbre. Could I even tempt you to say that there's something incessantly annoying about the mockingbirds? Uh, you just uh, nonstop. I mean, when you, you hear these things sometimes <laughs> and they just can't quit. Well, maybe it annoys some people. It doesn't annoy me. <laughs> and I've been listening to it a lot longer than you have. <laughs> I wish we had a key to understanding bird song to really get into the feathered nest building egg laying perspective of it all. Well, I kind of like to leave room for the idea that they're more than just utilitarians trying to survive. Darwin grappled with this. We humans from the dawn of time though have attributed all kinds of abilities to animals. We've thought they're a little like us at times. In a forthcoming companion episode, we're going to delve a little more into this puzzle with David Rothenberg, and we're also going to be learning more about his own musical exploits. We'll get him talking about playing his clarinet in a duet with a laughing thrush, connecting with humpback whales and cicadas, also done very clarinetly. 
So be sure to watch for that conversation in coming weeks right here on Constant Wonder. I'm Marcus Smith. Our podcast is a production of BYU Radio.